President, Rotarians, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak here this afternoon. I would also like to extend my acknowledgement that we meet today in the lands of the Ghana people and pay my respect to their elders past, present uh, and emerging. Apologies for not playing for Prospect. Um, the one redeeming feature is I did lose a semi-final to Prospect out here in 1998-99, which I think Prospect won that year. So uh, I hope that's a redeeming feature. But I'm really lucky to have had um, my background in both cricket and, and professionally and, and my family farm has brought me to two roles that, that I cherish dearly and, uh, and they're great fun. Um, for those, if it's not clear, my day job is running the show, the, the Horticultural Society of South Australia, and then, like um, everyone in this room, I, my volunteer passion is as president of SACA, so that's what I try and do in my spare time, uh, alleged, alleged spare time, as my wife and four kids would, would say. Um, uh, I um, thought, and, and hadn't really thought about this, and clearly my invitation was with both hats on. So I, I thought it was a good opportunity to step back and think about the two organisations, that being the Show Society and SACA in parallel, and see what sort of themes uh, would emerge. And so I thought I'd just quickly go through the history of both organisations and their purpose in, in uh, the South Australian society, um, what, what they give back into community. And as, as Rotarians, obviously, that's something that's very dear to all of your hearts. Um, some challenges and opportunities that both organisations have, and then perhaps some observations around the, the similarities of what makes them successful organisations. <clears throat> so to speak first about history and purpose, so the Royal Agricultural and Horticultural Society of South Australia was created in 1839. It's, the first show was held on a site in Grenfell Street in the car park of a pub uh, there on Grenfell Street. The royal prefix uh, has been attached since 1867 when Prince Alfred visited the colony. Uh, in the 1890s, it moved to a site over on Frome Road where the Adelaide University is now and where the zoo was. And it was there until about, well, until 1925, where it moved um, amongst great uh, criticism and controversy to this swamp land too far away from the city at a place called Wavell. And it's been there ever since. If you think about the site itself, think of it as a donut. In the centre is leasehold land that we've got from the state government. Um, and on the outside, uh, that the properties on Leader Street and Rose Terrace, the society has been able to, through very conservative financial management, acquire most of that land freehold on the outside of the of the site itself. So that now, as we sit here today, there's only two titles that the society doesn't own uh, freehold around that site. So it's an amazing 27 hectare site. It's got its own train station, its own tram station, uh, an extraordinary asset just two kilometres from the city. We really are the envy of uh, uh, similar social societies, not only in, in Australia, not only in the Commonwealth, but indeed across, across the world. Its purpose of the society was to promote excellence in agriculture through, uh, through um, exhibition and competition. When it was created, it was all about food security, of course, in the new colony. So getting farmers to farm in these weird soils and weird climates with animals and, and crops that may not have been fit for purpose. So clearly the purpose has evolved a little bit. It's not so much about food security now, but the focus of promoting excellence in agriculture through exhibition and competition still exists. So it's about the economic prosperity of agriculture and increasingly about connecting agriculture with um, the, the urban community so that people understand the importance of agriculture, the importance of farming and where our food comes from. SACA, uh, equally uh, steeped in heritage, it was created in 1871, so 152 year old organisation now. Um, this, it's always been based here at uh, Adelaide Oval when you think about the, the extraordinary heritage of uh, events or scenarios or indeed um, global political controversies that surround things such as body line. We had the amazing Adelaide test. It was the home of Bradman, of course. Um, the closest ever test uh, against the West Indies in 1989. And so it's been um, matched by a test recently in the West Indies. But an extraordinary heritage here. It was created to coordinate club cricket in, uh, in Adelaide, as it was then. It's clearly its purpose has evolved now. It's about not only managing premier cricket in South Australia, but it's also got a very deep focus on community cricket and developing pathways for elite cricket. It's also obviously evolved into not only men's high performance programs, but women's high performance programs. Um, and also it now is our 50% joint venture partner in running Adelaide Oval with the SANFL. 
Um, so it's got a very broad remit um, uh, in in creating this game or supporting this game of cricket, which which I personally believe, as a lot of sports and all team sports do, they have such enormous benefits into our community from a physical health perspective, but also an emotional health perspective, and, and what the club cricket infrastructure in particular provides out there uh, in, uh, in the community. When we talk about community, the show society has got about 3,000 members. It, it ticked over 2,000 members in 1907, which was the first society in the Commonwealth to tick over 2,000 members. It's, it's always had a very uh, strong membership base. It's got more than 30,000 competitive entries at any given show. Um, we have our Education Foundation and our Archives Foundation, and the, the uh, Education Foundation in particular has been a great beneficiary of the work that you do, and so sincere thanks for that. Um, it is the largest ticketed event in South Australia. We get half a million people uh, every year come to the show. Now that makes us the second, second biggest show in Australia outright after the Sydney Royal Easter show and clearly by the length of the straight the largest on a per capita basis. Um, and then we have a, a really big role in, in helping a lot of the regional and country shows as well with their operations and we act sort of as the I suppose the umbrella organisation helping them with their, their work. As far as SACA, SACA's got 27,000 members and a wait list of 7,000 people. In effect, it makes this the largest cricket club in the world, bar none. Um, and if you think about it, when you, rel you compare it, say, to something like the MCC in, in Victoria, um, slightly smaller, except, of course, that we all know that's at its heart, a, a football club membership. I mean, you just happen to get a, a, a day to the, the Boxing Day test every year. Uh, this is the largest sole-purpose cricket membership organisation in the world, something we're really proud of. And I was just discussing with Cam when we were in the process of recruiting a new chief executive uh, about this time last year. Um, we, we didn't have any problem telling or selling the opportunity of coming and heading up SACA. It is world renowned, um, being Bradman's home, uh, adopted home, sure, but, but it was definitely Bradman's home, help with that. But you speak with any true cricket lover around the world, they say, bar none, this is the greatest cricket uh, ground in the world. Um, it is not a stadium, it's a cricket ground, and, and very clearly, and, and, and the, those that were involved in the redevelopment of the Oval should, should be really proud of how this has turned out, and I'll talk a little bit about that uh, in the future. Um, as far as challenges that both organisations have faced, particularly in the last couple of years with COVID, they were very challenging for both, but in different ways. For the show society, we had two shows that were cancelled, so um, that is our largest event for the year. We obviously run that site, 27 hectares. It, there are events there three, 365 days of the year. Um, the show is obviously 95% of our DNA and who we're about, but it's probably only 40 to 50% of our business. So we run conferences and exhibitions, caravan and camping shows. We've got uh, the farmer's market there every year, um, sorry, every week. Um, the, the horse precinct, for those that know the site, that is now, um, for 11 months of the year, is a caravan park. So we take down the temporary uh, horse stabling and then that is purpose-built as a caravan park. And we're running, as you can imagine, with things like Mad March, with Gather Rounds, with Libid Golf, we're running at 100% capacity, which my team says is a great result. I suggest that perhaps they got their pricing strategy wrong, but <laughs> either way, it's a great, it's a great uh, little business for the society. In actual fact, though, that site has been designed as a multi-purpose site. So you, if you do walk the, the, the horse pavilion or go to the caravan park, you'll see it's got odd-shaped paving and concrete footings. It's actually purpose-built for Cirque du Soleil. So when Cirque du Soleil comes to Adelaide for the next 10 years, they will go at that site, and it's purpose-built so that their tents are on there. Um, they had issues when they were using Benighton Park about the environmental impact of having to dig up and be on the, on the parklands. So they've got a purpose-built site there with all the infrastructure they need so that Cirque du where they'll be here opening in June next year um, at, at the showgrounds. Um, uh, interestingly, the last time the show had to miss a show was due to another pandemic, the Spanish influenza. Um, another year that we didn't hold a show was in 1852, actually, and that's when all the men in the state were the goldfields in Victoria. So it's fascinating when you look at the history about why you do or do not host uh, an event. Uh, interestingly, um, up until 1923, there were actually two shows every year. There was an autumn and a spring show. As of from 1924 onwards, it was only a spring show held in Adelaide. So uh, everyone, everyone's talking about we've been around for 180 odd years, but we've actually had, I think it's sitting up about 245 shows have been held uh, by the society. 
The challenges for COVID for SACA were a little bit different. Um, we were encouraged and indeed um, requested by the governing bodies and government to continue having cricket because it's such, going back to the purpose of and the benefits of hosting sport, um, particularly our broadcast partners wanted to still have something they could telecast and everyone, if you're stuck at home, wanted something to watch. So we had to try and deal with the challenges of hosting international cricket here when we could only have very few, if any, people coming through the gates. It had very significant challenges from a membership perspective. Um, it meant we couldn't offer transferable associate cards, which a lot of people rely upon. It was a really complex period. The, the management team did a particularly good job of managing it through that. Both organisations have come out of COVID with really, really strong uh, financial positions and balance sheets that are the envy of their retrospective peers across not only Australia, but, but the globe. So it's been a fascinating dealing with COVID and what, you, what you've learned through that process. There is positives to everything, of course. I think we learn in SACA how to run the place a little bit more uh, on, a, on a leaner basis uh, and making sure that we weren't wasting any of the resources that we've got and reallocating what, what finite resource we did have back into the areas that matter most, primarily in, in community cricket. And we've also been able to invest a lot more in women's cricket um, over the last couple of years. Um, from a society perspective, we, we had a great relationship with the state government that meant even though we weren't having a show, and interestingly, a condition of our lease is that we have to hold a show every year. So Marshall, shut the state down. We had to then go and write to it and ask permission not to host a show because that was a condition of our lease. But um, we but were very thankful to the state government because they, of course, had their vaccine centre there for 18 months and they were a very good tenant for 18 months that took some of the sting out of not hosting uh, two shows. As far as the opportunities go, I think it's very clear from the show society perspective, having a 27 hectare site with a very strong balance sheet, with all that public transport infrastructure so close to the city, with a government that's really progressive and excited about what this state can do with the event-based economy, that you'd have to think it's a really blank canvas there of what we can do longer term uh, with that site and with that business. Again, just building on and making sure that site is sustainable and so we can reinvest our surplus cash back into the show, continue to make it really contemporary, really relevant, again, going back to our core purpose of promoting agriculture. Um, from a SACA perspective, I think there are huge opportunities in the women's game. Um, you just see we announced a new memorandum of understanding. That's when I say we, that's Cricket Australia. It means that professional women in Australia now are paid more than any other professional sport in women's in Australia by the length of the straight. So women are getting a 60% pay rise over the forecast period. It means the best women in the game here in Australia, probably the best eight or 10, will make more than a million dollars a year playing cricket. Uh, it is fantastic um, opportunity for them. Uh, you, if you're now playing WBBL and One Day Cricket for South Australia, you can make a really good living. It's a, a genuine career path for women now, a full-time career path. The challenge, of course, for that is we've got to fund the infrastructure to support that. So every ground now, instead of having two change rooms, needs four. They need to be able to support both men and women. Uh, we need more grounds. Um, and so that's a challenge for us as administrators of the sport. Um, of course, the other challenge is, is we, we'd all love a bit more on-field success. Um, we do punch above our weight at Saka, um, with BBL in particular, the white ball cricket. Um, we'd love to see a little bit more red ball success in Shield, and we're working very strongly towards that. Conversely, the women's program in South Australia, you know, we're reigning with WBBL champions. We desperately lost the one-day uh, final against Tasmania. Australia is by far and away the strongest women's cricket um, team in the world, so my association makes the South Australian women's program the best in the world, just based on who we are and where we're at. <laughs> When I, so as I said, when I sit back and think about then what are the similarities between the two organisations, as I said, they're both institutions that we should be really proud of in South Australia. They are not only do great things in our local community here, but they are revered not only nationally but internationally. Whenever you travel around the world or speak to people, both the show, and it is just known as the show, it's, it's a bit like Madonna or Elvis, you know, people just know the show, and then SACA, they really are considered as, as leaders in their fields. And, and I, so I came back to two reasons that I think that is potentially the case. Um, the first is that they both uh, celebrate and embrace their history, but it doesn't prevent them from innovating or remaining competitive. And a couple of great examples of that. You got here at Adelaide Oval, <coughs> clearly a very historic association um, with a fantastic heritage around the place. But this stadium is, is, is recognised as one of the best in the world. Even though you've got world-class facilities, you've still been able to maintain the hill and the scoreboard. So you've built 
use your heritage as a, as a platform to build from, not something you should apologise for or feel like you have to hide or protect. It's something you actually embrace and you build from, and it makes this, if you contrast this with the many hundreds of millions of dollars spent in WA, for instance, for a cement coliseum that really could be anywhere in the world. I mean, it's a fantastic stadium, but it's not a cricket ground anymore. Um, and so I think that those that, that had uh, the foresight to, to develop Adelaide Oval like they did should be really congratulated for that. I've already mentioned our women's program and how we've innovated there. Um, um, but simple things, for those that are SACA members, you'll understand what I talk about with the Village Green. So when, when we talk about the Adelaide Test Match, you know, for, for a large proportion of our members, and my wife would be one of them, they very rarely actually watch any cricket. They go out the back to the Village Green and you've got this real carnival atmosphere. The only way to describe it for those in the eastern states is the Adelaide Test is our spring carnival. It's our bird cage. It's what you do when you come to the crickets where all the young ones get dressed up and want to seem to be seen. I mentioned one, once at a members' dinner that... The, the, the Village Green has the second highest consumption of PIMS at any single event in the world after Wimbledon. Now, I've been saying that for three years and no one's corrected me, so I think it's just fact now. But, but it is an extraordinary asset and one the players love when we bring the Cricket Australia board out here to, to look at the test. It's something that they all try and replicate. They cannot do it. They just simply haven't got the physical infrastructure to do it. Uh, interestingly, the only ones that have been come close is Lords. So Lords is actually trying to take after us using what they've got in the nursery, that little ground to the, to the I think it's the eastern side of the, the Lords Stadium there where they've now got their Verve Clico and a few other things and strawberries and cream. But, um, it's something we do particularly want to innovate. We're going to have to continue to innovate because you know, we're in a really competitive market, entertainment market. Um, the innovation in the show society, I've already mentioned the multi-use uh, aspect of the, of, the, of the site. So we've got the Caravan Park, which is also Cirque du Soleil, which is actually the uh, horse precinct um, during the show. We do a lot of really good things environmentally. So we're actually a registered power station. Uh, on top of a lot of those exhibition centres is a large bank of power, uh, solar power network. So we're actually generating our own power. We are um, putting it back into the grid. We harvest our own rainwater. We've got very large rainwater tanks sitting under those awful... Uh, carnival rides. Um, so we, we're self-sufficient for, for water for about four months of the year. Um, and we've now got a waste system, a three bin system, where in 2019 we had about 120 tonnes of landfill came from the show. Last year we got that down to 17. And if it wasn't for a particularly busy last Saturday, where we had 82,000 people through the gates, we would have had zero. But we just had too many people, we couldn't literally empty the bins in time. So we're doing a lot of really good things environmentally. And we think um, when we come back to our core of building into the prosperity of agriculture, we've got to show that we can do these things environmentally uh, aware and, and feed back into that side of things. Um, and then even today, uh, as I left my office today, there was a sound check. There's a, there's a music festival on there tomorrow, Thursday, Friday and Saturday um, on the site, on the main arena. So um, looking around the room, I suspect no one in this room is going to go to it. <laughs> um, but again, uh, innovating, making sure that site is used as much as possible and we're building the financial viability of it. The second similar aspect that I see through both organisations is the strength in our people. Um, we've got great teams and it helps when you've got such a clear purpose and a purpose that's got such merit that you have people that get out of bed and really want to work for you and for the organisation and with great purpose. Not only on a paid staff, but, we, but neither organisation could operate without its um, tremendous volunteer army. Um, and, and supporter base and members, and, and I'm sure I'm preaching to converted an audience like this about the, the importance and the real value in, in a volunteer organisation. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence the South Australian Governor is patron of both organisations, um, and because we've got that great purpose and because you've got reasonable cultures, it means that you do have some great long, long, longevity of people in the organisation. So at SACA, I'm the 12th president in 151 years. For those that saw me play cricket, they think that's particularly apt. Um, and I'm just the fifth CEO at the show in 100 years. So you've had some very long-serving people and, and that um, you gotta make sure that you don't let that um, become stayed and just and, and stuck in your rut. But as, as I've shown through my examples of innovation, I don't think that's been the case. You just get great continuity uh, and, and the importance of people. So I think that was all I was going to say. Thanks again for, for the lovely words and the introduction and the invitation to speak, and I'd be happy to take any questions. So thanks, Rajiv. Thanks, Will. Any questions? 
we just heard from certainly the RANHS is in great hands and um, and uh, uh, Saka uh, as president as well. But uh, yeah, to Florian. Okay, <coughs> sorry. So this is a curiosity about like international cooperation. So obviously with cricket, you have obviously the, the, the predominance of test, international test matches. So the international dimension is very, very clear. Um, now I'm from Bavaria, so the Oktoberfest obviously has a side effect as a agricultural show as well. So what is the, with basically the show, do you look beyond Australia and how does this look like? Like are shows like this common in other countries? Do they differ significantly or how do you exchange and how do you kind of like follow up on that? Yeah, so, so there definitely is um, similar organisations and events around the world. They're, they're probably strongest in the Commonwealth countries in the United States uh, of a very similar nature. Um, there is an international um, association of fairs and exhibitions, I think it's called, based out of the States, um, which hosts this. is a very strong, they call them fairs in the States. They're, they're pretty much every county in the States has got a fair, which has got a very similar purpose. Um, and, and you learn a lot from them. And when you do do peer analysis and benchmarking, we stack up every day of the week against all of them. Um, you can imagine that there's everything from an event that gets, say, 20,000 people through to very large events in California, for instance, that might get two or three million people to an event. Um, some extra, very large organisations, some of them do fantastic things in education, in education, for instance, and a lot of their local schools will come and do ag um, education at the site. <clears throat> Um, when you dig down on how they afford it, most of them have got a dog track or a casino sitting on the corner of their site. So I don't think that we're going to be doing that at the society anytime soon. Um, but in particular, in, in the UK, you see very similar ones as well. Actually, Chelsea Flower Show has got very similar sort of background and um, purpose, but obviously from a horticultural perspective. And we talk about agriculture a lot, but um, there's a couple on my board that remind me that horticulture is in the name as well. Um, and we've got such a strong horticultural industry here in South Australia. Um, and then there's probably the... the the, so the benchmark globally is the Highland uh, show out of uh, Edinburgh in Scotland. So yeah, lots of lo lots to learn from those guys. Um, increasingly, though, you're learning from not just similar shows, but other precincts that, that you, you think of yourself as a piece of community infrastructure. Um, and what else can we be doing and giving back to South Australia as a state and a community because of all the physical attributes that we've got and the, and the privilege we've got of having that lease from the state government. So um, there are great sporting precincts. Um, there are great community precincts that you can learn from as well. You don't have to just have a show. Mine is, a, um, I guess, a bit of a personal question in that I could vividly remember, and we've all got memories here, of those of us that have grown up in South Australia, of, of the show. And one thing I just wanted to comment on was... Um, Congratulations on the way there's many affordable and free things for families to do at the show because that's obviously very important. But I remember vividly over 50 years ago as a teenager being paid 15 cents to lead a Guernsey cow in the Grand Parade. And so I'm wondering, is that still a thing? Are people, you know, from the public able to do that or has insurance got in the way of that? Um... Oh, yes and no. We, we, we pay a lot for insurance because we think it's really important that people can still, still interact with animals. I mean, it's core to our purpose. Interestingly, we just signed off our annual report. I gave the, the annual work health and safety report to the board a couple of months ago, and that showed that people are about three times more dangerous than wild animals. So <laughs> uh, when we look at the core of how people get injure themselves, but no, they still have grand parades. We still have interaction with animals. We do that. You know, it's, it's important that you smell, touch, feel, and, and understand what's going on. Um, we do have work experience students and, and the biggest growth area in our competitions is, is, is in school competitions. So lead weathers, lead steers, grains and those sorts of things, which is really important. It's bringing that next generation through. Um, my daughter, this, my youngest six-year-old, she was going through the petting zoo in my first couple of weeks at the show and she asked to go in the, the petting pen and I said she couldn't do that. And she looked up to me and in a very loud voice in front of a lot of staff said, I thought you said you were the boss of the show. So, <laughs> so we've just got to manage the things as well we can. But it's really important being able to see, touch, smell what you're doing is really, really important. So, yeah. Thanks. That, that was a great talk. And the parallels between the two organizations are amazing. Uh, I note uh, that you're close to the city. You have events that happen regularly. And uh, here, we have built a new hotel. I don't know how profitable it is. But you have freehold land. 
and you have clients who would want to stay at the show when they come down. And uh, it would be, I think there's a commercial opportunity. No doubt your board has considered it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think that's that's what you talk about with your strategic planning process is to make sure you get the most out of that site. But you, you, your assertion that you've got events there that people need to stay at um, would be almost a self-fulfilling business model, and I think that's something we're definitely looking at. The the, the um, caravan park is a case in point. Now that was obviously much cheaper to develop a caravan park than a hotel. Um, in answer to the hotel here, when I, mean, I sit on the board of Adelaide Oval, through nature of being president of SACA, and it's going very well. Um, probably a bit more relaxed now than when COVID hit and the hotel was two weeks old. Um, but as we all know, domestic tourism did wonderful things during COVID, so it's performed particularly well. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello, and thank you very much. Um, as I was listening to your talk, I was reflecting on our, the history of our club. We're turning 100 this year, I'm sure. Somebody's probably mentioned that to you. And I know we've been involved with the Royal Show for, for a lot of those years. And um, I'd love... Is, is there a possibility that we could do something at the show this year to recognise Rotary South Australia's 100-year um, celebrations and our partnership with, with you guys at the show and even with SACA, given that we meet every week at a cricket club and, uh, and, and an oval. I know I'm just putting you on the spot there, <laughs> but, um, but I'm really like thinking, wow, this, this is really great, because we really do believe that we're uh, um, um, an I iconic organisation as well, and the, the influence and the, the things that our club has provided to the uh, state of South Australia nationally and the world over the past 100 years. We're really proud of it. As you heard, one of our members is turning 100 next week. So yeah. um, just flagging it with you, just some little things that maybe we could do together. I think it'd be magic for South yeah. Australia. No, I think, I think it sounds like a great idea. I mean, we, we, at the show, we don't see ourselves as, as owning the show, if that makes sense. We're very much custodians of it. We understand why the society has to run it. You know, we're custodians of that event for the whole state, and, and um, it's the state that owns the show. So we have community um, organisations part of those nine days every year. So yeah, let's keep the conversation going. Yeah, that'd be great. Not too late for <laughs> <laughs> we'll give it a bash. Uh, no, All right. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Will, for that very interesting, informative and insightful speech. Uh, and as Heidi said, it's uh, many points for us to reflect on as we approach.